This podcast and every other podcast I make is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, who are the reason that these somewhat niche podcasts are able to exist. Supporters on Patreon get ad-free versions of all podcasts, now including Playwatch Listen, plus extra content outtakes, even longer episodes of Playwatch Listen have existed on Patreon. And for a recent update, because this previously wasn't happening, Patreon will now also receive all video versions of Playwatch Listen without YouTube ads. So check it out if you want to support the show. Our current goal is to be able to fund, hopefully, monthly play watch listen animations, but we have grander plans beyond that too. Of course, you don't need to do any of this. It's just a nice way to support the show if you enjoy it. Now, to the show. All right. Hi, Mike. How you doing? I'm good. It's been a while. When was the last time I actually saw you? Like, well, I haven't like been on the show for like three weeks, I don't think. Mm. Um, turns out a uh, video game launch. Hell of a thing. It's a bit busy. Quite time How did that all go? Yeah. It was really cool. It was a really cool experience. So we had um, a countdown day that I was a day that I happened to be in the office anyway. And so mm-hmm. there were just people all over the place um, with uh, TV screens that were like this many hours until launch. Uh, oh, yeah, like they literally put the countdown yeah, up on the screen. So it was there all day. Oh, um, and then, you know, had like just a bunch of beers and white claws and food and stuff in the office that night while everyone was waiting for the countdown, which was really cool. It was very cool to meet so many people that I work with in person for the first time, um, of course, including, yeah, and this was a really cool something. thing. I had maybe like, I'm going to say 10 people at the studio come up to me either at the the countdown night or the launch party and Mm -hmm. say that Playwatch Listen inspired them to get a job and now they work at Santa Monica Studio. No way. Which I thought was the coolest fucking thing. And I was like, and we work together. That's crazy. Um, Yeah, it happened happened tons of people just being like, you know, I was going to give up and then the way you guys talk about it and like the suggestion to go to GDC, I just did all that stuff and now I work here. And I was like, all right, well, I'm glad we're not totally full of shit. That's so sweet. (laughs) I'm yeah. always amazed by that because I've I've hit the age now where I meet people in industry in industry who are like I loved your games when I was a kid. Like yeah, that's the, that's that how old really I'm getting weird. now. That's the one that's like weird. But, I'm but really excited cool and lovely. to have that one day though because like people that I work with so often in meetings go like, oh well, when I was working on <laughs> Far Cry Two, and I go what? Yeah, <laughs> and it happens so often that I'm like, I get to be that for somebody one day. I get to mm. be like, when I was working on this thing, like that's cool. Uh, I feel like I freak out all the time. But yeah, so that was really cool. And then we had just an actual rap party the day after, which was at, um, I think it's called the Coliseum in LA. It's where Fortnite usually does their E3 party, so used to at least, uh, which is a very Mm. big, cool thing that's definitely uh, more money than any other company I've ever worked for because the IGN holiday parties were usually at like some tiny bar. And the Rooster Teeth holiday parties were at the office. (laughs) And so they rented out like... The Olympic Coliseum in LA, uh, amazing food. Um, yeah, it was it was it was just a really cool experience, very celebratory, and obviously people seem to really like the game. So, yeah, that's great. It reviewed phenomenally, right? I'll be honest, it, I still need to go back and play the last one, so I'll get. You to haven't played God of War twenty eighteen. I I did the thing I often do. I can't remember what it was. It must have been that there was like an event or a milestone. I played like the first five, six hours, had a really good time, and then just got busy for a month and never came back to it, which happens to me all the time. It came it's out got in nothing April, the which is like kind of a weird That might have been it. Maybe it was time. the E3 kind of. Yeah. Um, I got caught up in like, I think maybe, we were, was it, do you remember, what year was that? 2018. 2018. It came so out 420, 2018. Or well, 24 It might have us. been the E3 where I was doing Wick. Potentially, like, there was something. There was basically something that ate up my time. I can't remember. I also was. have this like weird thing of the E3 where you were doing mm. Wick because I was supposed to go see it but couldn't, and I remember being very upset about that because I got an email about it. I was supposed to go see it. This was before we had this show. And I remember like that was there was one of two games that I couldn't see that I really wanted to see, and I feel like that being 2018 makes sense to me. <laughs> like, it might I think have been. That it was either that or 2019. The yeah. best one, that the, the E3 one was fun because we had a room just wrapped in gold. The the funniest thing, and I might have even, if you had come along, I might have made you do the exact same thing, was was Greg showed up, Greg Miller, mm-hmm. to, to look at it. And it was, it was like two days into E3, obviously knackered back-to-back meetings. And both of us, uh, we were just chatting. And we, he was chatting about, we were chatting just about general shit and starting to get onto the like, and here, we're here to tell you about John Wayne. I could just tell he wasn't that super like interested or he's tired or something. So it's just like, hey, we're friends. 
do you want to just close the door to this room and tell the people outside that I was reviewing, I was showing you this game for half an hour and you'll just <laughs> lie on the floor and talk shit to each other? So me and Craig just hug out in, wow. that, in that room, pretending to be demoing a game uh, just because we both by that point were so knackered. We were like... I know that you were a nighttime yeah, appointment yeah. for me and there was there mm. was a reason I couldn't make it. I think it was like a demo on the show floor or something went long. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Um, and you were at the fig or you were at a hotel, right? We were at a hotel, yeah, just around the corner. So it was it was difficult enough to get to that I think you I don't think you were the only one who couldn't do it. I think there were a couple of dropouts for the yeah. same kind of reason. Just like literally like logistics of maybe yeah, it was, people it was, don't realize it was this, right? How big getting E3 there. is. Well, how like, many fucking people there? If you are? don't get the like, yeah, getting yeah, yeah. anywhere. If you don't get around. Like CES yeah. is a nightmare of a show that I hope I never have to work again. The last time I went there I just DJed a party, which was great. But working CES mm. as a journalist was hell because it's so hard to get anywhere in Vegas in general. And when people have meetings in different hotels and you know, you try and you get in the, the lobby or whatever, and you're trying to yeah. find somebody's room or you're trying to get from one hotel oh, to the next hotel, elaborate. just connecting yeah. two hotels together and everything's trying to keep you in a casino. It's yeah, it's, a mouse trap. You're, it's actively working against you. It's, it's, it's so fucking hard. intense. Um, I've never done CES. Uh, I've never, the, only, the only Vegas things I go to are Dice. But yeah. That's much smaller, yeah, obviously. Dice is super intimate. contained. It's, it's great. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. even then, usually like, Dice last year, I just ran into Austin. I was like, where the fuck do I go to get my badge? <laughs> you have to walk me there. Um, but CES <laughs> also has the problem of there being so much tech in a small space, or relatively small compared to the amount of tech, that your phone also just won't work. So again, mm -hmm. being a journalist and trying to find people or contact people or like just meet somebody on a show floor, just so difficult. Like it's, it yeah. is a very cool, oh, I just got a notification for PC Game Pass. I have uh, one free month of PC Game Pass and have PC games waiting. Thank you, Xbox. So exciting. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, that audio is going to show up. So <laughs> just letting everyone know. Um, but yeah, definitely not my favorite show to work. But I had this... Um, Thing the other day, like, again, you know, but what I do now is awesome and it's what I've wanted to do for a really long time and I wouldn't trade it. But I was just looking through old photos and being like, man, the way that E3 was even five years ago was fucking awesome. And uh, mm. it's sad that that probably won't exist now. Obviously, E3 is now read pop. Um, but even then, that like my job would never work the same way. Like, I won't just go to E3 yeah. and walk the show floor ever again. Like, it's very, it's very weird. The passage of time. Yeah, if you're ever there again, you're going to be locked in one room yeah. for four days. Answering yeah. the same questions over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. I always feel With bad about that. Big smile on your face. That's such an interesting question. Thank you so much for asking it. <laughs> no, they're lying you're when they say that. Time. I get that all the time. Oh, damn it. I knew it. <laughs> I actually had, I had that. So like, I can't remember what it was. I think it was when I was doing John Wick promo and like there was someone who asked a question that genuinely was really interesting mm. and genuinely was the first time anyone asked i remember like i said it and i was like oh but actually like for real this time like i know we always say that to you but that's actually like it was good actually it was a, fun, a good question. fun moment like yeah. i'm actually not bullshitting you right now that was interesting. <laughs> um. yeah i love that now I'm, I'm excited to see where e3 goes but it's definitely like just a mm. big a big shift and a big change and i also had this thing where i was just looking through old photos again i don't even know why i was doing it i think i was i was deleting stuff and um Seeing all these photos from when I worked in an office kind of hit mm. me in a way. I'm very introverted and I like my own time a lot. And working in an office was not good for me because I'm always so tired. I'd get home and I'd sleep at 7 p.m. and then wake up the next day at night and go to work. Like it just wasn't a great way to live. Um, and that's not even an exaggeration, the amount of goddamn sleep that I need. And so I'm much better off not working in an office, but still seeing pictures of like how social I was made me like, mm. damn, like, I often go a week without talking to anybody. It's like just a couple that's of That's also podcasts. about getting older as well. Like yeah. that's definitely like, like I look back at pictures of like me in my, like when I'm, when I was in my twenties, moved to London and just like was out every night hanging out with people. Like it's just, it's yeah. I've it's, never it done changes that. as you get older. I mean, I think I did that when you know? I was like 16, I was going to nightclubs using my sister's ID. So I got that out of yep. my system real early. Oh, I burned out on nightclubs before I was legally allowed to go to them for sure. Definitely I exactly same. same. I think I was like, like 19 16, and 17, I was like, 18, done. <laughs> don't need any more of that. I'm good. Yeah. Hard That's pass done. on that, which is also yeah. um, time. What is it? Um, but yeah, so I'm assuming that you have not played Ragnarok. I would have loved to have spoken to you guys about it, but no, it's I will. Okay. I will. I need to just find the time. I, over Christmas, I I genuinely need to catch up because I've just not played with um I have with the things we're working on right now. I've just year. never. Yeah, it's I've bad. just not had the time to play games at all. Did you play Immortality? I think that you and Austin might have spoken about it. Immortality, I did play. Did you like the it? The only reason I 
Fucking loved it. Absolutely brilliant. I think it's his best. Um, the um, the did you not like it? No, so, and I, I not... want to know where, why. Where did it not work like it. for you? Let's talk. This is the this yeah. is the, this is the podcast. We're <laughs> Here talking we go. about immortality. A game that most people don't know of, but you should. We I mean we talk about his games on the show all the time. And we're gonna spoil everything. Yeah, no. spoil the whole thing. Um, um, well, I haven't played it or finished it, so. Um, no, I haven't either. I think to be my fair. issue but, with well, it. Well, I've technically I've seen the ending, which is something that at some point I need to talk to Sam about because I always see the ending in his games before. I'm supposed That's to. That's probably common with this one. Yeah, my, I think what's it might immortality be. It's something... For anyone who needs the context, okay. what are we talking about right now? Immortality what is, is it? a video game yes. released this year. Mm-hmm. Um, Immortality, it's uh, uh, the, the premise of it is you are basically given um, a bunch of reels of footage from three movies and like associated material behind the scenes, Some talk interviews, show interviews, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you are basically, and this, I, I can see why this maybe. I'm, I'm just, I'm starting to preempt what I think you might not like about it, but it definitely kind of relies on your own interest in kind of clicking through those and kind of discovering all of this stuff. And then the the, the main mechanic of the game is scrubbing around. Well, sorry, the main mechanic of the game because the Sam Barlow game is what's going on in your brain in terms of re- constant like recontextualization of what you've seen and kind of piecing this together. But the actual like the interaction, the mechanic is. Um, it's that thing that I can never remember the name of, which is about the juxtaposition of two shots. But it's basically you find moments of like an object or item in the scene, and you tap on it, and then that opens up a new clip for you. And you're kind of so you're kind of basically like unlocking essentially just all of these sequences. Um, and eventually you get both, you know, uh, uh, best bits uh, version of a film, and then a bunch of behind the scenes materials. And you're kind of uncovering, I guess, the central question of the of the of the story is you know why is why did this actress stop being in stuff that's like the the thing you're trying to f- discover and then there's there, then it becomes very horrory in a way that I wasn't expecting and really oh, freaked it? me out uh, oh well someone should have told me that Oh, we are going to have to have layers of spoiler conversation on this call because there's a, there's a layer that I think a lot of people haven't seen of this game mm. which is substantial Did you ever play inscription after we spoke about it I did. I never got past. I've not got past like the first game, basically. In okay, because so that's one of those ones that it's like you don't want to talk too much about the other shit that's in it because finding out that that stuff is there is the coolest part. That's part of the thing with immortality, but I genuinely think some people just haven't spotted it because of. And it's. I think there's a specific controller reason. Basically, you have to do something with the controller. If I'm, if I, uh, we talking. I'm, I'm trying to work I out. I would if talk you know around it because I don't know what you're saying. Okay, so yeah. there's like there's a controller, there's an input method. So basically, you're you're using kind of these weird controls to kind of move back and forth through footage, mm-hmm. and there's a quirk to that interaction that reveals like an extra layer to the whole thing, which made it so that I couldn't play the game at night anymore. Like that's how scary it becomes if you find that element that, of it, okay, or at well, least to me, who go is absolutely because I've already tried to play swimish. it three times and wasn't into it, and now I'm like. It's gets scary? Okay. So here's my it issue. It got scary to me because I'm very, very easy to scare. Okay, I'm noted. I'm absolute Okay. Wimp. Well, I am yeah. too, but I really enjoy it in video games. Um, My issue okay. with it versus his other games, which I like very much, and I feel like I always say his. I should. It's a team of people. It's always me. Dis- That's true. Unfortunately, yeah. discrediting everybody. Yeah. Their games. Um, Is that I didn't actually feel like I was solving... A, a, uncovering a mystery. I felt like I was randomly clicking at shit and then seeing what would show up. And I didn't feel that mm-hmm. way about the other games. So like, I felt like, you know, her story, I'm digging into something and I feel like I have a direction for what I'm choosing. Whereas with mm. Immortality, oh, the cup's clickable. Let's click on the cup. Oh, a new scene. Oh, the hair. Let's click that. But it wasn't, there was no yeah. driving force for me to do that other than looking at imagery, which I can do anywhere. Um, so I think that's yeah. what it was, is that I didn't feel like I was um, as involved I don't think that's a fair criticism. I certainly, that was my, like, my first hour with it, I remember, like, thinking, like, is this it? Like, because it does, the, 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 with her story, there's obviously, like, the finding of keywords, you re that feels the most investigative of all of these, yeah. but telling lies as well, just the kind of, the way the, the juxtapositions of the two halves of the conversations, and you're kind of holding it and putting it together, do you play you get, that one? Yeah, yeah, but you still get very invested in those conversations. Yeah, you get, yeah, yeah, it draws you in, whereas yeah. I think with this one... It kind of drops you with some clips that aren't particularly interesting, and and the thing that's interesting about it 
is kind of hidden in a way that the first time you discover it is shocking and surprising mm-hmm. and scary and interesting. I do love that. But if you've not gotten to that point yet, and it's it's that classic thing. It's why when someone recommends a TV show to you where they're like, oh, it gets so good in series Let's three. Play Final like, Fantasy gonna... uh, 15 or whatever. <laughs> I think it's 13-2. Right. And they're like, you just have to get through the first 30 hours and then the game gets good. Yeah, so I, I'm always I'm always kind of uncomfortable giving those kind of recommendations. But it's good to know though because when I saw yeah, everybody raving it about it, I was layer. confused. Like, no, and again, even the the fact that it seems a lot more passive than their previous games doesn't feel like a. I'm not even trying to criticize it. It feels more of a preference. no. And the passivity doesn't change. The passivity is still present. Okay. It's just it's just a recontextualization and a. Um, a layering of narrative that's interesting. That that the kind of that that kind of sense you've got of like I don't really feel like I'm finding anything out. There's or the mystery is not intriguing when you start the game. I just didn't feel it like it takes a, detective, a while. I, think, is the thing. I didn't feel yeah. like I was actively uncovering the mystery. Whereas the other yeah. two, I don't know if they do they have more than two games. I've only played Telling Lies and Her Story. Those are the only two I've played. Okay. I, mean, I think maybe, that's it. Yeah, maybe. There's probably um, one. There's, I mean, obviously, um, Sam directed a uh, Silent Hill game before that, didn't he? Um, yes. Whichever one that was. Because uh, that was when I met him. I should know was, the name he of just, that. He, um, he chipped, they chipped Google. that and he was, um, he was just halfway through her. I remember this is one of my... The funniest thing about being like an indie dev in the UK, because it's such a small country, <laughs> is like you, you meet everyone, basically. And I remember me and him, I think we both like talk to a, a student thing or something. Uh, yeah, um, you, just, you just meet everybody at a school. Uh, so it's Silent Hill Origins and Silent Hill Shattered Memories, both of them. That's right. Um, yeah, they're, they're the two British directed ones. Which That's also right. Sam Marley. So he, But I, I remember meeting him in this bar and chatting to him and him basically telling me what her story was. And I remember, and I've told him this since, Like I remember just being like, ah, no one's going to play an FMV mm. game with like a Google search bar. What is he talking about? Like, just, I remember in the moment just being very much like, that's that doesn't sound I like I mean, anything. they're not and that broadly just, played. They're just extremely beloved by the people who do play. Her story was big. Was it? Like that did some, uni- I think her story is like in the millions. Yeah. Wow. I don't know about the other ones, but I know, I think her story was like across is all it, of its platforms and it was Game obviously Pass. on mobile. Them, oh, true. It was on mobile. Yeah. Them being on Game I think Pass Immortality is on Game Pass. I believe yeah, it is. I played it on help. Steam, but. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they're definitely unique games and I'm very glad they exist because they really do. Like you're right. And I've never thought about it that way before that they rely on your own brain is mm-hmm. a mechanic a lot. Um, did you play Obra Dinn? Yes. Okay, good. Loved it was it. Like, if you hadn't played Overdone. My favorite of that year. Great. Yeah. I, I'd leave the show immediately if I'd not played Overdone. Oh, yeah. I would have been upset if you specifically had not played Overdone. But same yeah, thing, I, right? I, I like, I had a notebook for shit. I was like, you know, down yeah. writing notes. Me and, Carrie, me and Carrie, like, sat down, like, and, and uh, as is often the case with me and Carrie, That's I'll right. like, be playing something and she'll be interested. Yeah. I played it and we played it four hours on that first night taking notes. And then the next morning woke up. It's like, we have to go and finish Obra Dinn and played it for another six hours or whatever it was. And yeah, it's a great game. Yeah. Um, But I feel like it's, it's definitely a thing with games like that, even though Obra Dinn is, I guess, not that dissimilar in a weird way to to the Sambala and team games. Similar idea, kind of scrubbing through key points of, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Connecting things and figuring out. Oh, I fucking love that game. Mm-hmm. It's so good. Um, so good. And yeah, I do think that, that that mechanic is a thing. And I think that maybe that was the absence of appeal for me uh, with Immortality was that I didn't actually feel like I was really thinking very much. I was just watching. And again, I don't think it's... I I'm, think, not trying yeah. to, I'm not trying to relay a criticism. I think I'm relaying a preference. I don't think that I think it's a bad yes. thing. I just think I don't enjoy it as much. I think as well, I think the thing with Immortality is I think... And and I, I I I like it to an extent is it's not making you a detective. I think the mortality more than any of the the previous stuff is it's you and it's very much kind of saying to you, here's some video, check it out. Yeah. And yes, there is a certain point where something happens and you're like, is is the game buggy or evil <laughs> like you're like there's like genuinely like a mystery is happens, and, you, that happens and that's what kind of gets you through is it something that people could find at a different time like is it just like one of the clips triggers it because for context um, everybody I if we didn't say you watch you can watch all these clips out of order and what you're trying to do is piece them together yeah. at a timeline right but you would watch them all completely out of order different to everybody else depending on which mug you clicked on and which thing you clicked on from there it's like just a big web 
It's a layer. The answer is it's a layer. So it's it's essentially, it's always, it's something that's present in the game. Everyone who's played it will know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like if you played Mario and they didn't tell you there was a jump button and you were like, this seems like a pretty boring kind of running across the screen. And then you realize there's a jump button and it recontextualizes. It's it's kind of weirdly Metroid-y almost, like a one layer of Metroid of like, mm. you, you gain this knowledge that this thing is in the game and it you pl- you start playing it differently Maybe but I'll it's still not like it's not time. it doesn't add depth it just basically um expands i can give you i can give you a clue after we finish recording that will kind of steer you very okay. quickly towards faster. finding this thing out because i've tried it three times mike yeah. three times it's like i really I can want tell to. you a thing that will get you onto this track within like 10 minutes of playing the game right, so that might be a good let's do that yeah, sounds we'll, great we'll <laughs> i'd like to try it again Done. Definitely, yeah. It was one that, um, because my dad likes watching video games, so when he was in town, mm. I mean, my, my whole family has, I think my mom watched me finish Fable 2, and I had this really cool moment mm. once where my, my stepdad is exactly 50 years older than me to the day. We're both born on August 24th. And mm. he was watching me play Wolfenstein, and I didn't know, I didn't have any context of him ever playing video games, and he was like, is this Wolfenstein? And I was like, the fuck do you know about Wolfenstein? And he was like, I played Wolfenstein when I was a kid. And I was like, oh my God, yeah. that does make sense that you would have played Wolfenstein. And I have very good memories of my family watching me play video games. And I, so I was like, oh, this could be a cool one for dad. He'd probably like his other games. So let's try Immortality. And I feel like the interest disappeared so fast from him. And then I was like, well, I'm not going to make you keep watching a thing you're not interested in. I don't, mm. don't want to lose the thread of you enjoying watching video games. And then um, tried to play it again by myself and couldn't. Tried it again after seeing how much everyone else loved it. Just It's also, honestly, not a game to play with your dad in the room past a certain point. Like, it goes into Fair. some places that might be awkward. Fair. Yeah, yeah I... I- I'll try. I'll try it again because it's like, like I said, my backlog this year is so bad. Um, did you have you played Pentiment mm. at all? I'm, I'm going to assume you're going to say no based on the I've, time of the release. I've not, but I've you you've raved about it so much. It's definitely on the list it's for me. Very it's very good. One that you were very excited for. Yeah. Did you have a good poop? I wouldn't go in there. Give it. Is it a good one? <laughs> he said he wouldn't go in there. <laughs> give it ten minutes. Um, yeah. So Pentiment's like a similar one of of just uh, a game that I would consider to be very dense. Uh, mm. in that you you kind of have to play it all at once. And I, f- I feel like Immortality is probably pretty similar in that I think if mm. you tried to space Pentiment out over the course of six months, you'd be confused because you really do need to know who all these townspeople are and what all these characters are up to. And Oh, it's snowing. Oh, well, that's a lot Aww. of snow in Vancouver. That's very pretty. Um, and yeah, I feel like Immortality is the same. I don't know how long it is, but... I imagine if you stop playing it, it's probably not going to work out great. Same as Obra Dinn, right? It's not a game that you want to walk yeah, away from. Yeah, I'd say they're both, but they're, they're, they're binge, they're, they're, they reward a binge. So how long's, how long's Pentiment then? Is that like a day? Can I do that? No. Uh, 15? 15 hours. Yeah. One review okay. said they finished it in 13, and notably that was the most negative review that I saw. And I was like, okay. you finished this game in 13 hours? Um... I get why you didn't love it because that you got to be spamming through dialogue to finish that game in 13 hours. I would say it's 15. Is it, is it maybe is it another couples thing? Is it like Oprah Den? Would it be one that maybe we could play together? Do you think? I or think, is it more yeah, of a Yeah, no, solo? I think you could actually once you get to act two yeah. because it's a murder mystery, right? Like the stuff that I think is fun oh, is like is, a, okay. a couples game or I've played more games like like uh, I played the whole of Oxen Free with an X and that was a really mm-hmm. fun time. Anything that's a mystery is fun, right? Um, yeah, because that's that's fun for the second person who's not holding the play the yeah, controller. Like to have those input. games where there's a little bit of something. Yeah, because her story yeah. we played similarly. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah you could give it a try, but yeah, I think it would work because it's also a thing okay. that I really like about Pentiment is you're trying to figure out who committed uh, the the murder. And mm. there's actually um, I was just talking to Josh Sawyer about it, and there's no canonical answer. You choose, and whoever okay. you choose as the murderer gets put to death. But at no point will you ever be told if you are right or wrong. And I think that... That's fun. Yeah. And it's I, very medieval as well. Very medieval. Oh, this yeah. guy, I guess. Kill him. Whatever. Like it's, And I think yeah. that's really, really cool. Um, and I, I actually kind of want to go through and like watch other people's playthroughs and see who they chose and what their reasoning is. Because I think it would be a really fun discussion game. And they, I mean, they're just so much fun. I actually... Um, I just ordered a PS5 to home in Australia that's supposed to arrive today, which... It's shocking. It said it was going to take a month, and then I guess they came back in stock. Mm-hmm. Um, because my plan is to show—I might even return it when I'm done—to <laughs> show 
to show each family member uh, God of War Ragnarok because none of them have a PS5. So I was going to play it for my mom and then play it for my stepdad and I'll play it for my dad and then my sister as well. And maybe even my grandma to be like, hey, here's what this is. (laughs) Like my sister can can play video games. My mom uh, can she plays games but has a lot of trouble with dual sticks or whatever. So mm-hmm. I thought that I might go home and do that. I might even record it just to see what they think, especially because the opening hour is very emotional in a way that I was actually worried about. You know, when I first played the opening hour, I don't know, two years ago, I was really worried that um, it starts as too much of a downer and people wouldn't like it and would be like, this isn't God of War. Uh, but it is just people all over the internet crying you know, in a good way. So I was like, okay, crisis averted. Everybody likes it. <laughs> we'll take it. I think, I think, well, I think with, especially with all the Sony first party stuff, like I feel like it's, I think Sony's taken the audience with them. Like Sony's kept play it. it there's a, they've retained that audience. So the audience is like mature and interested in those kind of stories Yeah, in a way that is, I guess you can only really do when you have like Sony has been just like looking after that generation of gamers all the way through. It's definitely um, an interesting thing. Ditto about- with Xbox. Xbox has done a similar thing. Yeah, true. Just slightly later. Yeah. It's a very interesting thing with um, God of War specifically is that I feel like it literally has aged with the audience. Yeah. Like dad game, right? It's like the logic is the people who were playing this when they were teenagers. Uh, well, it's my it's my age group. It's like it's yeah. like I, I think the first God of War came out when I was just a bit too young to play it, but it had like gore and boobs. So like I you know, it as a teenager, it came out, like, and I think I was like how eight. Was, yeah, Let me check. so I was I would have been a how yeah I would have been a teenager then. So maybe I was old enough to play it. I remember Let's it being check. like one I where I was like on the out. cusp of God of War one release date. It was really funny the other day. I was talking about how old I was when that came out with um. <laughs> one of our employees i'm not sure if our title's public but uh she was mm-hmm. like are you serious because she had worked there we've had a lot of employees who've worked there for a really really long time the first one was 2005 2005 allegedly so i would have been i've been 20 i remember i that's weird i remember being much younger when that came out yeah, i guess it shows how mature i was at 20 fair enough um, <laughs> you were a child a mere 20 year old as a child. that's weird yeah I, in my head i've totally put it into that it fits bucket in of classic like gta PS1. 3 yeah, 100%, and kind of, but it's yeah. not there oh, well that's it i played gta like, 3 when it came out that oh, was no. a late stage so that's the classic example then of like a, a very late ps2 game yep. it's that it was that thing where you used to i don't know if it's as common now just because the consoles kind of blur together a bit more um but like with the the, the end of the ps2's lifespan like amazing because the developers all knew how to make use of the of the hardware so yeah. all of those last ps2 games similar with ps3 i mean um, the, yeah so the it must have been right towards the end of the PS2. last game that came out on the ps3 is so nuts when you look at Same it compared thing. to the launch titles you're like jesus christ yeah, yeah. that's it's crazy well, consoles used to be much harder to make games for so you, it took yeah. years to learn how to do it like, i think people you know, now, still now say the consoles are the switch is kind of tough when nintendo hardware is a little bit tough or has that changed now too Totally. Um, well, it's tough if you're doing with the Switch. I mean, I mean, nowadays at my level, you're using, you know, you're using an engine, so you're using Unity or Unreal. So the Switch is just a, a layer of that. But yeah, no, it's the the Switch is obviously like much lower specs than the other devices. With P with PlayStation Five and the Xbox, they're basically PCs. So from an architectural point of view, it's much more straightforward. Whereas I remember working like the first consoles I was working on were like. I worked on a PS2 game. Like one of my first jobs in the industry was PS2, and um, and there, like that hardware was it was it made no sense to anyone. It was yeah. it was all it was especially Western developers because a lot of the documentation and even the code was like in Japanese. Like it was a completely no way wow culturally weird thing. And it, it was it was fine. Like I, when I say the code was in Japanese, everyone's screaming at the screen. The code wasn't in Japanese, but a lot of the kind of the terms and technologies were kind of yeah. We're, we're kind of separated from a Western developer. So yeah, it was it, nowadays things are a lot more straightforward. But yeah, still it takes time to learn the quirks of stuff. And we're always like, we're always profiling, um, you know, consoles. I'm just working out what we've announced and not announced for various reasons. <laughs> um, when you're, when you're working on console stuff, you are always kind of profiling, working out like, oh, where are we, where are, where are our bottlenecks? Where are things mm-hmm. working and not working? And yeah, I guess it gets yeah, easier. Switch, switch, and, switch has its quirks. And the, the, uh, manufacturer side, um, the engineering side can get better at helping you. Um, yeah. I was having an issue with a dev kit, like just a setup thing, and it was complicated and I needed a bunch of help. 
And then I happened to CC uh, one of our producers, Carol Chung, whom I love, um, on an mm. email thread. And she previously worked with PlayStation Hardware Engineering. And the way that Carol immediately was That's like, met, huh? we'll just do this. And I was like, I really should have thought to just ask Carol first. But I was like, well, I don't want to bug her. That's not, she didn't, shouldn't have to worry about this. And then immediately she was like, this will work. And it mm. did. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> like, of course that wouldn't work. Yeah. Yeah, she, people she's outside awesome. of industry and people in industry a lot of time forget that like tech is 90% of what you mean when you say tech is just knowledge people in the office have. Yeah. And if you just go and ask them, you can find it out. It's it's what makes it's one of the many things that makes the current Twitter situation interesting is like by firing those stuff, they will have lost information that is required to run that website. They, you know, I, I not everything is documented stuff in three fucking brands. weeks. It just gives no. me an error every time. And everyone's like, there's less bugs than ever. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself. Come on. It, no. It, but you're absolutely right. Losing people's knowledge is like one of the worst things about people leaving in general. Um, oh, yeah. Like, it, I mean, I think that's applied to every company I've worked for, but it, it feel like it, is, it hits especially hard in dev uh, where oh, you've sure. lost somebody's knowledge. And if they can't pass it on to the next person, that's just gone. Like, it's it, it's terrifying. <laughs> Very intimidating. And likewise, the flip of that, which is nice, which is when you have people join, like we've we've done, I was talking about this with someone earlier, because in the last year, we've gone from, I want to say five or six members of staff to 20. And like so cool. what happens when you bring in that many people and from like cool places and with lots of experience and previous games under their belt, like it's, it is, it is like, it feels like our tech got upgraded because now mm -hmm. we just have all these clever people in the room who know how to use this stuff and how to do great stuff with and it. And I feel like you can and also like, find out what's phenomenal. wrong with your system. Like um, we had somebody Massively join so. my team <laughs> and be so. like, it's hey. Been most of the year. Yeah. And somebody join my team and be like, hey, what this? And it was like, oh, yeah. But because everyone else on the team has been looking at the same thing, we don't think to ask questions because it's just that bubble and you need somebody else to join to be like, what about this? And be like, oh shit, yeah, you're mm -hmm. right. And I think that's like totally a thing with with tech in general too. Is they're going to be like, Mike, um, this sucks. Did you know that this sucks? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know this system literally really obtuse? Yeah. I've had two calls today that have been dealing with that exact problem in different shapes and different were, places. But they were they were both about your personality. So those were both like directly complaining yeah. about me. You but, suck, but that though. is. Well, the, I do suck. I do suck, and it's good. But it's good to have people around me who let me know that. Yeah. But no, it's it's the, the but the but all joking aside, like the the institutional stuff is just as important. Like the stuff we've learned from just bringing in people who've worked in other companies. Who we've we've brought in people from AAA and other mm -hmm. indie studios and stuff like that. And the amount of just like, hey, why are you not doing this like this as a company? And just going, oh, I don't have a good answer to that yeah. question. That's a really obviously better way of doing this. You know, and it's just, there's been so much of that kind of, the company's just completely shifted in how we do almost everything because we've got all these talented new people coming in who who know better. And it's just been, yeah, it's been amazing. Benefit of hiring Tiring, people. exhausting. I bet, yeah, you're having a great time. Is it a, a Pepsi yeah. kind of day today, Mike? What kind of day is it? I don't even see a beverage. Well, it's, it is. I am drinking a Pepsi. There you go. But the, no, it's it's been, you know what? It's been a busy day today. I've had lots of calls. Today was one of those back-to-back -back calls kind of days. But, is that uh, uh, like okay. a big part of your job at this point now? You're effectively, quote-unquote, yeah. managing more people. Are you stuck in one of those positions where you are less creative and are more meetings-orientated? That's my least favorite part of my job um, is the amount of time I have to spend in meetings. I'm very lucky in that my me I have I have some really good people around me who remove a lot of the meetings that are not creative. So most of my meetings are creative. Oh, that's awesome good. then. So I have a lot of yeah, I've got like, you know, my business partner who does all the kind of biz dev and day-to-day and -day business stuff. I've got an office manager, I've got a producer, like I've got people yeah. around me who can kind of carry that burden. It's a to bit your more, credit that you I left them to, too. Like well, I've heard horror stories oh, of yeah. indie studios where the director slash owner felt that they had to be involved in everything because they didn't trust other people to do their oh, I'm, jobs. I'm like that sometimes. I'm, I'm definitely not gonna, that person. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to, if I, if I, if I pretend otherwise, I'll be lying. But no, I, I think, yeah, but that's been the, that's been the, I think I've said this on the show before. That's been my process over the last 10 years. It's just going from dude who did everything to like evolve into dude who does my thing quite well, but everyone else will do much better with everything Part of that's else. probably also learning like, what you're good at and then just being like, let me just yeah. do this thing a lot. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. I just, no, so it's been good. I can't even imagine but, the amount of pressure uh, that you're under, but, you know, congrats again for, for 
uh, growing you. a team and you know Tron. It's been it's it's been good and Tron's been good. It's it's like it's yeah it's a shift but it's been really fun and and yeah what we're what we're able to be doing and the the toys we're going to play with and oh, yeah. yeah it's just been great. I'm torn so. between uh, two questions that I want to ask you so I'm just going to go with the first one because I think it'll be a quick one and the second one's a question mm-hmm. I've wanted to ask you specifically for ages. I'm like well this is a mic episode let's go first one just related to our previous conversation do you have a game of the year this year what would your 2022 game of the year be based on uh your <laughs> limited time to play video My games which again pool. i feel the same My fucking way this pool. year it sucks <laughs> you're allowed to say immortality if you want it might be immortality mm-hmm. that's what i'm thinking i'm thinking i'm trying it's it's it, you know when you're doing your game of year the game of the year and you're like what knocks the obvious answer off the top spot i think it might be immortality that's right. even though i would be the first to say and I, I think, honestly, I think Sam would agree. It, it's mechanically, it's not the most interesting mechanic I've played this year. But I would say, just from like a, a story level and a surprise level, that's probably. I don't think it's like, probably the winner. It's a thing that gets that was very difficult at, at uh, when I was in press, um, even before IG and I yeah. had to do some of this stuff of trying to quantify what best means. Like yeah. <laughs> I have, I think Portal One is the best game ever made some days and then the next day i think it's portal 2 and the reason that i make those arguments with myself is because well portal 2 only exists because portal 1 exists but then portal 2 has a better story by a mile but then i like the the um sort of reduced very tight but what would be your decimal review score of both games because i'll give you the 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 situation like (laughs) i i and it's it's a weird thing of trying to quantify like yeah. when you ask someone for that game of the year, I can give you what I think the best game of the year is, and then my favorite game of the year. They aren't necessarily the same thing, and mm. I think like that's it's an annoying thing to have to do to yourself, but you do have to do it. Like it's hard not to. Um, I don't. Yeah, I, don't I think for me, it's thing. the one that I think has had the most impact on my brain, and I think yeah. I would say Immortality is the that's the one that scared the shit out of me, mm-hmm. and that I was thinking about while not playing it. That's a big one for me. Is like, yeah. I, am I walking around my life with this game still existing in the back yeah. of my head? Mine are uh, Elden Ring and Sifu yeah. because I can't say God of War Ragnarok doesn't count, and I also just like don't look at it as a video game. Um, mm. Yeah, be Elden Ring and Sifu, and I actually think Sifu I wins for me weirdly. Um, I think really? Elden Ring had like a very big impact on me, and I was so obsessed with it. And I do think it's like one of those, like it's a Breath of the Wild um, in mm. that it just inspires so much awe because of the sense of discovery. And I think that's a really beautiful thing about video games. Like even reading a good book can be kind of similar feeling, but I don't feel like I get that a lot from other entertainment mediums where the appeal of Elden Ring is in walking around and, and turning a corner and seeing something that you had no expectation would be there. I remember like the first times that I was playing it, this is one point on the map, or at least I had a group of friends that were doing this in like a Twitter DM thread where I'd just be like, have you seen this? And I would just have a screenshot of the map and draw a little X, but I would never spoil what it was. Because I was so often just walking into something and being like, holy shit, just the way that it looks, the way that it moves, like the animation is so on point for that game. It's the the sense of discovery that I wish more games would tap into that I think Elden Ring just absolutely nails in a way that just makes it like so wondrous. Um, Again, same as Breath of the Wild for me, being like, have you fucking been here and seen what this thing is? Mm. So cool. Otherwise, it's Sifu, um, which... I think is even related. Like my favorite FromSoft game is still Sekiro. And that's because it's a rhythm game. Sifu is effectively a rhythm game. Um, it's really stylish. I love the the sound design. And uh, just something about like mastering those levels and going, have you played Sifu? I've not. I've watched a lot of footage of it. Okay. So you're probably familiar I, with it yeah. conceptually where like at first I was like, okay, mm. you go through a level and you fight people. Got it. Fine. Yeah. But that's not it at all. It's going through a level and figuring out how to approach the level until you can get through the level without dying. And the fact that like the first level, I think the first time I played it, I didn't even get to the end. And then the second time I'm playing mm-hmm. through it repeatedly just to grind effectively <laughs> or to like change my XP. And I can do that without dying ever. It was, I just fucking loved it. Like really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, so those two would be my picks, but I think there was actually a lot of really good games this year, especially in the indie space or indie adjacent. Like I consider like Pentiment's mm-hmm. not indie. But it, it has that kind of feel to it, especially when it's such a small team. It was team made in, in an indie adjacent way, right? 13 like people. it was a little skunk works. Yeah. yeah. Same as uh, maybe Grounded was the 13. In any case, both of those games, which I love, I love Obsidian, I love all the, the stuff they're doing right now. They're one of my favorite studios right mm-hmm. now. Is um, mm-hmm. Both of those games are indie adjacent in that they're Game Pass games. So I guess Grounded was Greenlight before Game Pass. But 
they're really small teams within a big AAA team who's obviously working on uh, Outer Worlds 2 and Avowed would be their, their big blockbuster ones. So it's just like like Cult of the Lamb. I'm trying to think of like all the... All the just Cult of the Lamb was excellent. So that good. was a beautiful game. Such fucking oh, bangers. So my second question... Mm. We had spoken on an episode before, and Monkey Island actually did this, about um, the concept of having different cuts of games. Like, say you could have a cut that has mm. less story or a cut that has more story rather than just a difficulty option. And, yeah, the new Monkey Island actually kind of did it, um, which is really mm. cool. I have had this conversation a bunch recently and was like, let me ask Mike, why do you think nobody has... has uh, at this rate, and it surely it can't be ideas. Surely someone's thought of this before me. Put in a <clears> rewind <throat> function for cutscenes. If you're missing something, you get a phone call. Somebody says something. Why can we not pause and rewind a cutscene in a video game? Oh, there's so much, so many reasons. It just um, seems like such a no-brainer, Mike. Just, just you just code so it, easy. right? Just do it. Yeah, just do it. So, <laughs> it so so it depends. So it's boring answer maybe but it depends is the is the genuine answer i mean yeah every game runs differently <laughs> but like yeah none of so, them have done it right so there's a few reasons i would say i'll roll through them and it, to be if to be fair a lot of them are similar he's <laughs> <laughs> always staying out of frame. it's similar to um why is there why do you not why can you not skip cutscenes or pause cutscenes? Yeah. which is often always a yeah, question. same thing yeah yeah so the first question, the first answer, and I think probably this is more frequently true than either of us would like to admit, asshole creative director. Like, <laughs> like, fuck you. You can't skip my story. You can't skip my cutscenes. You, you know, this is my vision. How dare you? Mm. And I've been, I remember early in my career before I was making my own stuff. Um, I remember working on a project with cutscenes where the entire team did a, basically like a, all of us signed a letter to the director of that game begging this person to let us um to put a skip button on the cutscenes because no we're like this game is objectively worse because of our bad cutscenes and we as a team wow. would like to allow people to skip it um, wow and i imagine that would that, mortify a director i mean we a self-aware director sure um <laughs> but uh <laughs> but yeah so that was so so i've been on that and, and i think that's something that again players i think sometimes don't realize is that those conversations happen internally as well like if 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 the community is saying something is wrong i promise you 100%. people within the team There's were also saying it was wrong like, at some point someone on the team also didn't like it <laughs> Someone didn't like yeah. it. And someone probably got in trouble for moaning about yeah. it. So there's that. So that's the first reason is people don't want their vision touched, and I I I, I don't like that as an explanation. But I can I can I, it definitely happens. The next one is um is often the case is rewinds are uh, uh, cutscenes are hiding loading. So for example, yeah. like I think this has been the case forever with like the um the Call of Duty games. So Call of Duty when a cutscene's playing, it's a video and underneath that video is a loading bar that's invisible to you, you can't see and it's literally like going to take Pre this, I think this generation of consoles obviously loading got a lot faster, but pre this generation of consoles, like Call of Duty levels were taking like minutes to load. You just didn't notice as a player because there was a cutscene playing over the top of it. So if you allow someone to mess with that video, um, via uh, extra by a skipping, memory that's needed. Well, like the rewinds, right? Well, it first of all, you might see a loading bar because if we give you a rewind, we have to give you a fast forward. So if you skip through a cutscene or you, you get that loading bar, and that's often the case is you can skip a cutscene on like a Call of Duty and you'll see yeah. the loading bar. But yes, with rewind, so there is a, a, there's proprietary tech that exists. I think uh, Bink's probably the logo everyone's seen at the start of a bunch of games with video, um, basically how to make video stream on a console. It's easier now because the technology is stronger, but like has always been like a tricky one of how do you make video stream at high quality, as you say, with like as low a memory input as possible, a memory uh, footprint as possible because you're you're doing all this other stuff behind the scenes. Um, and just kind of keeping in sync and doing all of its things. Video is tricky because most computer game code isn't designed to work on an absolutely reliable 
uh, rhythm, it's built to happen as fast as possible before you render the frame. Mm. So there's a whole. So making video and ga- and games interact is is always like a point of like weird technological trickiness. And there's a lot of middleware now that kind of deals with that for most developers, so it's fine. But that could be part of it. The more control we give you over playback of that video, it causes some weird issues. So that's part. That's that's the next one. The one that I think is most interesting is. Well, not necessarily most interesting, but like I think is often the case is cutscenes that are rendered in engine are doing so much trickery all the time that making stuff able to be cleanly rewound is tricky. So particle effects in video games, for example, are often uh, not designed to go backwards. Particle effects... Uh, don't have causality in the way that you'd expect for, or mm. that you'd see in like a video. A particle doesn't exist until it's spawned and then it goes through its life cycle and plays and plays out and then is despawned and deleted forever. And noth- nothing about that path that particle took is, is saved. You can use kind of random seeds in order to make them predictable, but whenever you've seen a game as a mechanic have rewind in it, it's so much more complicated than people realize to make that work. Rewind, because because everything in a game is designed to roll forward. Going backwards mm. is tricky. Even um, if it's a so, cutscene, uh, which in theory is more akin to a video? If it's playing back in 3D, then it's basically... In, in the way most of this is set up, it's still using all those video game text. So you would still True. be using a particle system that's like a game. You'd still be rendering. Um, but yeah, most video games... I mean, to even, even function, Darth- video games are a bunch of tricks, right? Like to function at all, oh, it's a bunch, and, yeah. of, a bunch of shits hidden in a bunch of places to make anything function whatsoever. And so anything you new you want that. to do requires work. Yeah. yeah. The, but another good example is like with um, animation. So a lot of the time, and every game's different in this regard, but with animation in games, um, obviously frame rate is variable. So you don't know if the game's going to be running at 60 FPS, 30 FPS, 20 FPS if you're making a PC game and someone runs it on a bad PC, or in the future, 120 frames a second when PS6 allows you to play backwards compatible, but everything's up to 120 frames a second. Like, nobody knows. We don't know what the situation is going to be. So most, so good games and most modern games are frame rate independent in the sense that, like, you can play them at different frame rates and it will basically play the same. If you go back and play a lot of old games on emulators, like the car will move 10 times as fast because it was never meant to be played at right. a, a reasonable right. frame rate. Um, with that in mind, animation, for example, often in games isn't actually playing like 30 FPS, like frame by frame by frame by frame by frame, because it has to look smooth over, say, 60 frames a second. It might be automatically kind of tweening between those frames. Otherwise, you'd get kind of that that, sp- that Spider-Man um, animation effect where things are out of sync with the frame rates. So even animation is faking blends on a frame by frame basis to look smooth to you. So if you pause an animation mid-flow and rewind it you've got to then predict where you were on that smoothing Mm. so that you can kind of cycle back. None of these problems are impossible to solve. And there are games, obviously, that have done rewinding. It's a matter um, of if it's worth it in a lot of cases. It takes, exactly. And when you're making a video game and you're up against a deadline and you've got a list of thousand jobs you've got to do, adding a rewind feature to the cutscene is never going to get like priority placement. I'm sure I've said this before, but I think um, I didn't realize until working in AAA that so much of game dev is um is is this is this worth the cost like so much of it is like you can have this idea but is it can we weigh up if we have that thing then we probably can't have this thing and that's not stuff that happens at the end that's stuff that happens the whole way through of like well yeah you can (laughs) do that but if you do that then we can't have that um because it's finite (laughs) and it's so finite. Yeah. And I think that like there's so many things and you'll see people on the internet be like, oh, it would have been cool if you did this. Why didn't you do this? Why isn't this boss bigger? You're like, okay, for every time you have to make that boss bigger, we have to cut a puddle. Something else has to. <laughs> yeah. And, it's, it's and, so and, that's like, and honestly, the fact that you that it's your belief that those decisions are made throughout the course of development immediately tells me that Santa Monica is a well-run studio. Because <laughs> a yeah, lot of game studios... 
a lot of game studios don't make those decisions until towards the end, and that's why crunch happens. Is because yeah. the scope just gets out of hand. And some, I've, I've definitely, I've had conversations with developers where they're like, "Why would you? You don't know what game you're making for three quarters of development. It's like you better because you're gonna, you're gonna really, really hurt people towards the end if you've not made those decisions." Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it is always a trade off. It is always a decision making process, and those decisions can be made for lots of different reasons. What's interesting, and I, I remember reading someone say this that that's kind of video game what what the difference between like a junior member of the games industry and like a senior experienced person is is largely their ability to predict those kind of trade-offs um and and to know like okay that's that thing is going to cost us a lot because of xyz the amount of games where i've like wanted a populated town like just in general Like, but what if there were people in it? You're like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Do you know how hard that is, and the amount of shit we have to have lose their for own... that? Yeah. yeah, and and the, 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 yeah, and it's always it's always those those things. What's cool is you get to a level, and I'm not, I don't think I'm at this level. But when you meet people, and I bet there's a lot of people you work with who are like the 20 year veteran, that person is often amazing at knowing. Oh, this is going to be so expensive, but here's how we can do it. You know what right. I mean? Like, and finding that solution, and that's where ju- genuinely awesome things come from. Um, and the other thing is, you know, the technology advances, the industry experience advances. Something that is really difficult to do now won't be in a few years. Yeah, you know, we're going through we're we're going through that right now with a lot of stuff on the visual side, thanks to Unreal Engine Five. Like the conversations that are happening around like stuff that was inaccessible to developers only you know a few years ago is suddenly like, no, we can actually talk about that now. That's interesting. Um, and it's happening on a million fronts with all the engines and all the hardware. So it's it's always you're always learning and kind of figuring yeah. out where those lines are. But yeah, we definitely it have is a always joke a trade about if we can make a character float. Can they just float? They can't fly because that's a whole new mechanic. But if they float, we don't have to animate their legs. Can we just? Yeah. We want to have a character here. Can we just make them float? Like, like an invisible skateboard, then so they can, can just, just play their idol, and you don't have to worry about yeah. anything. <laughs> Everything's so much easier. Very similar to a conversation float. I had today. Yeah, that's yeah, one hundred percent. It's become 100%. a running joke, and like anything that's got four legs, you're like, do we need that thing with four legs? And then Ragnarok is very much a wolf game, and I mean the the amount of time that it took to make that um, the dog sled uh, was the wolf sled, I guess, was extremely difficult. Like. That took years. But there will have been a conversation where someone was like, because I bet you there's other wolves and four-legged animals all over that game, right? Yeah, because there's one, there's multiple. Because yeah. you've got the system. Yeah. Like, that's the thing, and that's the trade-off, and that's the genius of, like, the really experienced skilled yeah, people. Yeah, we've got this go, wolf. Yes, this Let's thing is expensive, but now we can do wolves. I think wolves. there's one yeah, part exactly. of the game where you do have, like, <laughs> it's really funny. It's like a bunch of wolves just keep showing up. Um, and I yeah. would say that that is literally that they were like, well, we've, we've already fucking spent all that time making the goddamn wolves walk. Um, and that was also like a pretty late thing to happen to for a really long time throughout the, the, all the builds, the wolves were basically just skating, um, because animating them was really hard. And even their facial capture, there were a lot of like scenes where a wolf is supposed to do something like sweet or cute. That they're just... <laughs> I just got the image of someone sticking little balls on the face of a dog, you know, <laughs> dog facial capture. A lot of wolves. <laughs> Um, a lot of wolves and yeah we so we it's just awesome. have a bunch of wolves because making anything with the amount of times that i heard the word quadruped <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. just keep getting notifications on this pc did you know jeremy d is now playing uno everyone's gonna see the <laughs> the capture because it's i haven't turned it off um oh is it just coming up in the yeah it just of the keeps video. coming That's up amazing. on the on the podcast the game pass and now it's jeremy yeah. playing uno um but yeah it's definitely stuff like that that i just never considered and Again, I'm sure we said it on the show before, but everything that you you think, why didn't this game do this? Someone at the studio also thought, and it wasn't possible yeah. for any myriad of reasons. It is, difficult. but the conversation can shift. Like this is what's really interesting to me on the accessibility stuff is everything, every single accessibility feature that you know Sony games are massively known for now. But but even like the the kind of the smallest subset of that that indie games often do, like all of that stuff was and is a difficult job like yeah. it's something that takes away time for because everything is it takes a long time but it's so interesting watching that conversation because of the people who've evangelized that stuff because of the people who've kind of spoken up on it and because honestly the pressure that's been applied to especially to triple a studios that's to why like, i made the accessibility awards that's the whole purpose exactly. was just to make people go we should probably do that and what how, how saying, to tempt the I'm games saying, industry without awards what i'm saying 
is now you have to start the re- the re- the best rewind in cutscenes award. Well, it's, it's put a category in. Yeah, I guess and, it's like uh, extra. No, we could do it. I was going to say extra tough for us with the uncut camera, but it it could still it could it could in theory be done. But you're right. Is, is it a priority? Is is probably the biggest thing, and um, it just seems like it would be fucking great because even I like playing through something. I I will have to I miss a cutscene and I'll miss context all the time, and it just seems like something would be very helpful. But you also have to prioritize like are people playing it for the cutscenes? How many people are? What game is it? Like, what would be relatively? What I imagine would be relatively easy would be um, like a cutscene replayer because there's there's definitely games that have done that. Like with Metal Gear, I remember the Metal Gear Solid Two, I think, and you could literally like swap out the character models, which was a fun gimmick. You, but like those kind of replays, because save and load is tricky way, as well, though, right? So the way that I currently do it, if I miss something in a cutscene, that um, on the Xbox you say Xbox record that. Or at least if you had Connect, I don't even know if it does it anymore. But you can save the last like 15, 30 seconds on Xbox oh, and on PlayStation. All... Well, it yeah. the I don't even really know how that works, to be honest, because I don't understand it on the hardware. It side, must just be saving it must be constantly recording and then just deleting. Deleting it constantly. Old chunks. Yeah. Because like yeah. if you get a trophy on PlayStation, generally you will have a replay of when you got the trophy, mm-hmm. um, which is like such a cool feature. So I would usually do that. If I miss something, I'll pause and I'll, I'll check the last 30 seconds or whatever, uh, which is definitely an option, but it doesn't work on PC because PCs don't function that way. Uh, and you don't have that much control over how much time you're trying to go back. The whole cutscene, how long is the cutscene, whatever. So it is a good alternative that it's just, yeah, must be constantly recording and deleting. You know what another factor is is so save load is tricky. Like like again, games are designed to be played in order. So if you want it, if you, so, it's quite hard to add. Like if you wanted to take a game and go, oh, I just want to go back like two levels earlier and start from there. That's actually a tricky thing to kind of figure out. As, as depending on how complicated your game is, really? like that can be in itself tricky. Just because you're a, because save save data is is not designed to be used that way. Save data. You can you can do it, but like it can it's a tricky thing to add later potentially. Mm. Which is what I was going to say is is with a lot of things in game development, the later you leave them in the process, the harder right. they then are to do. Right. So like localization for example, we as a studio, we localize from like the first prototype just because it's such a nightmare to add localization to a game right at the end. Um similar with like uh, UI scaling. So, you know, going back to the accessibility thing, like it's something we've, we definitely got dinged for on previous games that our text was too small. Mm. So we, we started doing UI scaling, but like again, like day one, from day one, all of our games, we are now, or at least the ones I'm directing are like UI scaling from, from the start. You do these things early, it's much easier. Cutscenes, because of the nature of productions, cutscenes are often the last thing you do because cutscenes are dependent on art from every other thing in the game being close to final in order to kind of finally set them up. Um, or they're using ass- they yeah you know, you're using assets everywhere. You don't do the cutscenes till the end because they're sometimes they're done by like an outsourcing company. There's just lots of reasons the cutscenes are usually one of the last things you do. So at that point, adding any functionality is quite tricky. So if someone was doing the cutscenes and went, oh, it'd be really nice if there's a rewind button. Chances are you're already past the beta and no one wants to add major features. Yeah. So that could also be a factor. Yeah. But it's kind of, cutscenes are often like an afterthought from like a production pipeline point of view, you know? Yeah, you have to prioritize the, the video game parts first. And, um, like accessibility, yeah, which is reasonable and as a game, totally. that's what I like. But yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The accessibility stuff um, at Santa Monica Studio was being worked on constantly, which is awesome. So it was basically <laughs> constantly being worked on in tandem with every other part of the game so that, you know, whenever we had a new build, they would just have the new accessibility options in the build constantly. Um, yeah. The team of... It's the best way to do that kind of feature. Yeah. Sure. Um, headed by Mila, who's... Uh, I should look up her actual title. I think she's, like, UI lead, but also um, Sam Schaffel, who came from Naughty Dog and then worked at Santa Monica Studio. Uh, both of them were, like, so, so wonderful. It's um, Mia Pavlin is lead UX designer. And mm-hmm. she's the one who's done most of, like, the interviews regarding a lot of the accessibility stuff, which, again, is awesome. But there are some producers who are really passionate about it as well, uh, which is super important. Um, but it was basically constant. Like, it wasn't a, an afterthought. It wasn't a, 
maybe somebody thought of this. Let's try and throw no. that in. It was literally just the two things in tandem at all times, which is why it ended up no. the way that it is. It's awesome. It's the only way to. It's what it what it's what makes it really hard when you launch a game, and, and definitely like we launched a couple of games while the accessibility conversation was just starting up. And I remember getting like valid criticism of our games, going, "Oh, well, this this isn't very good for these kind of players." Um, and the, the heartbreaking thing is at that point, like changing that, fixing that would be such a massive chunk of work yeah. that we just wouldn't, yeah. we wouldn't be able to do it. And, can... and especially scaled up to AAA, that would be even impossible, more impossible. So yeah, doing it from day one, that's Super the best important. way. Anything like that is, you know, much easier if you do it with immediately kind of from the start. Yeah. And I, I don't think that, I think people who need certain accessibility options should always speak up about them. And then it, it's of course, not that's not what I, but to be clear to the audience, no, that's not what I'm saying. Like, like, definitely speak up. Yeah, you I'll should come. always okay. speak up cool. about it um, because part of the problem with accessibility is how would you know somebody needs something? It's a very difficult thing to actually put a lot of research into because it's also an impossible problem to fix. There will never be a game that is 100% accessible. It is not possible because you don't know the global needs, right? You can make things as accessible as possible and cater to as many different kinds of disabilities as possible. But... If you don't know that somebody has the need, how would you know to make it? Um, so it's mm-hmm. it's a thing where I don't fault people for not having accessible games. I've been very disappointed in things for not having accessibility options. Um, like I recently had a stream that was a sponsored stream, but I couldn't play the game. So I was like, this requires bu- rapid button presses, and that's a thing that I can't do. And I've spoken about my issues with that. Um, so I was like, I would have loved to have, but I literally can't play a game. Uh, it's just mm. too painful and requires me to like ice my wrists and I had a lot of trouble with the original Spider-Man and um, that I can play now. And like Miles Morales, I was like, Ooh, this hurts a lot. Um, and I could only play it for about 15 minutes, but they do have accessibility options that really help get rid of like rapid button tapping, which is always my problem. So it's like, mm. it's something that yes, you have to think about from the start, but it's also something that I don't, I never expect anybody to, have all the answers or be perfect. I just expect them to be open to it, I think is the thing. It's like, yeah. just at least let people suggest and want to hear that feedback. Um, unless you're a jerk. When you're a big old jerk, then that is also possible. Um, yeah. But yeah, because you can never know. You can just never know what all of the accessibility needs are. And that's why you need consultants and you need a bunch of people to help. And you can play God of War Ragnarok with one hand. And big part of that was that Sam Schaffel, who was working on the accessibility team, I believe he was like full time on that team, um, only has one hand. So he was our play test for that. You, you play the game with one hand, Sam can play the game with one hand. That's it's fucking awesome. The fact that you can do that is so, so, so cool, but it still mm-hmm. requires the, that specific uh, need to not need that specific disability, like someone to actually test it with that specific disability, which is not accessible to all studios in the world. Santa Monica Studio, it's a lot easier for us and, and Naughty Dog. But it's such an exciting area of design so as well. Cool. Like I think this is it's like I like the 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 kind of the UX challenges of just like doing a con- like doing anyone who's ever tried to like you know take a controller and work out a control scheme knows how impossibly difficult yeah. it is to work out just a control scheme assuming there are two hands on the controller like the idea of taking something as complex as god of war and making it work uh one-handed and presumably with either hand right that's yeah. that's going to be part of it too yeah. like, i'm amazed by that that's 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 phenomenally cool and that's like yeah as a as a designer the opportunity there to kind of come up with new stuff and try new stuff that's just i think we're gonna see i've said the same thing about like uh I, although narrative design is further along but we're definitely one of the coolest thing about things about games is that we are constantly inventing new jobs and new kind of people in the process i came into the industry like as one of the first kind of generation of game designers, like it was, there wasn't really the concept of game design three or four years before I started my career. Interesting. And I'm now, on the design and, and now team it's, at Sony. The writers are yeah. on the design team, which I think makes sense. That's really because cool. Because um, I've said this before on the show, but I feel more confident in saying it now. I imagine this is the case at a lot of AAA studios, like at least the people who work full time. A lot of my job is narrative design to the extent that while our narrative designers do do something different, Um, I'm effectively just a different facet of narrative design. And I think, again, that's why I'm on the design team. There isn't a writing team. All of the writers are on design. 
10 years ago, you would have been a contractor given two months. Exactly. Of and that, yes, those are That's people who just thing. more just write. They're like, gameplay says, hey, we need you to write this and you write but it. But that was it. Like 10 years ago, like when I came into industry, that was, I remember, I remember the writer would come in for a couple of days, sit with a team, play the game, go, oh, I see what kind of game this is. And then they'd go off and write us. Like, yeah. and that's my point is Wild. that's what's exciting about the games industry is now we have this amazing field now of narrative design and writing. And as you say, kind of it, it blends, it becomes part of the process. That's really cool. I think the same is going to come with this kind of accessibility approach, sure. especially as the audience is aging, especially for those reasons. Like, yeah. I think there's just, it's just I can't play a video games without wearing glasses anymore. My eyesight deteriorated. Mm. I think a lot of it happened during the pandemic and I have to wear my glasses and I can't, I can't, or I just can't see or I'm like doing this at the TV. And uh, <laughs> the things that I didn't need in God of War 2018 that are really helpful in Ragnarok, um, we have a lot of text options and they're really cool, but one of them is like a blurred box behind text and it helps mm. so much. And I think that's a part of accessibility that a lot of people aren't willing to accept that I like, I've been on a bunch of rants about is that accessibility isn't just for people who are born with disabilities. It's also for you as you get older, you stupid fuck. <laughs> like yeah. it's like, okay, yeah. I came off a motorbike and I couldn't use my hands. There are certain games I could still play just a little bit. Um, I, I, you know, I got tendonitis in my wrist. That's why I can't do any uh, rapid presses. And that's how I got so in involved in accessibility in the first place why I cared so much is there are games that I can't play because I played too many video games and I fucked my thumbs up. Mm. Um, this can happen to all of you. <laughs> like accessibility options this also will mean, happen to all true. of you. It's true. Your right? body that's will fall apart. It will be harder to play video games. So accessibility is something you Steve should want so like, you can play games this. as you get older. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. You're, you're temporarily able. Yeah. Yeah. It's and then situational the, disabilities are a big one. It's like you get in an accident. You can't play video games anymore. You lose a hand. You can't play video games anymore. That can happen. Um, the, the we're all we're all going to need these tools, and I think yeah. that's that's what's interesting to me. Situational is, is disability that we're is a really seeing... big one that I've been trying to talk about more mm -hmm. recently because yeah, people like have it in their head that accessibility is is just for a certain kind of person, but it's it's for everybody. And situational disability is like, say you have a puppy, um, and the puppy goes to tear up your couch. The game doesn't have a pause menu, so you can't pause, so you yeah. lose the boss fight. Uh, that is a situational disability. You are. Uh, unable to continue to play through that because of the situation that you're in and you are disabled from doing that. Um, so it, it's, I don't know, I just feel like we should reframe accessibility because people have a weird negative association with that word. I don't think it should have a negative connotation. It's an awesome thing, but it's really just customization mm -hmm. and customization that will support you under any circumstance in any situational disability for anything that you can't do for any reason, uh, whether it's an injury, whether it's you have a baby, any relatable human thing that you are guaranteed to go through, these customization options can make sure that you can still play video games. It's a win-win. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. I just, I, there's, it's weird the things people choose to be territorial about. It's like <laughs> Star <laughs> Trek fans complaining. I saw Star Trek fan. I'm a big Star Trek mm -hmm. nerd. I saw Star Trek fans complaining. Oh, they're, they're just trying to get 20 year olds into Star Trek. It's like, what are you? What's wrong that with that? That means you'll get more Star Trek for the next 30 years. What are you talking about? Like, it's just, it's, yeah. I've it's, never it's, understood it's kinda... gatekeeping. It's so strange. Yeah. Like, why would you not want more people to like the thing you like? I don't know. I guess that it does make sense. It's it's insecurity, right? It's just people who feel special. That's that's what it I is. I saw a really interesting. I don't. I it's it, it's a lot. It's a bit pop psychology, but the, I, it was it was an interesting concept. Was the idea that the the kind of our generations are. Um, because we're having children slower, we're owning property slower. Because we're just not basically gaining ownership of things at the young age that previous generations did, that people are placing much more that kind of um, that kind of uh, uh, materialistic or ownership kind of love that, that mm. or the idea of like expressing yourself via the things you own is being passed not on to, is being passed onto media rather than onto things. So it's not that your house proud your um, you know, DC proud. Wow. You know, like it's like you 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 put those Huge emotional win links for capitalism you... there. Huge <laughs> right. win for the system. Jeez. I don't know. That's. I mean, that definitely sounds like some pop psychology bullshit on some level. But there's something to that. I think. Have like, you ever read Brave New World? Are... You need to stop naming things that I should have absolutely you haven't read Brave enjoyed. New World. I've never at least you played Brave Immortality. I, um, do you know what it was? It was Brave New World was on the reading list at school, which is why I didn't read it. There's no, no easier way to it get me to not read a book. It was on the reading list at school? I remember Brave New World, yeah. It was, a, it was one of the books we were meant to read at school. What the fuck? 
I, mm, in my late twenties, I'm like, Oh, this book, um, in a, in a way that like I was telling, uh, some colleagues that I was reading it and I was like, I, I texted someone on my team and was like, why didn't you tell me this was going to happen? It has <laughs> some really fucked up stuff in it, but, uh, one concept in it that I, I, the thing that I'm specifically referring to being fucked up is the eroticism of children explicitly mm -hmm. in the first few pages. Um, and torturing babies happens in the first 10 pages uh, in a way that's like, oh my God, um, I understand why it's all there. It's painting a picture. Like it, it has purpose. It's not like indulgent in a gross way, but like children sure. are punished if they don't like engage in erotic play uh, wild. But there's this theme in it that uh, every time it comes up, I just find so interesting. That is basically um, new sports are invented and they are only allowed to be played or to be passed on or like to, to flourish if they require you to buy more things than the last sport. So you can't just have <laughs> soccer anymore because that only requires a ball and some goals. It has to also require like gear and uh, a paddle and like you just have to, every new sport must require you to consume more things than the last sport so they saw warhammer coming is what you're <laughs> yeah, saying pretty much that's what it was. <laughs> and you so you just have to keep like it's a it's a culture that's based on consumption and that you need mm. to consume and that that is an accepted part of society it's like you must consume at all times keep consuming we must make more things for people to consume and part of that that kind of works in this world which is not a world that anybody is suggesting is good it's an extremely negative book but um the like dystopia effectively it's it's not they're not trying to say it's a good thing is so what you're saying is a billionaire's going to try and reproduce it in the next couple of years then yeah fair enough you could see it happening they really didn't get snow blind they really didn't get nope. cyberpunk as a genre nope. um, anyway sorry come on. yeah it's everyone else in society is also in support of of the consumption and then the other theme of it that is very prevalent is i guess everybody's on drugs to make them happy which also seems like a part of constant consumption is that you and your needs will never feel mm -hmm. fulfilled. I guess they're all bred to um, be in certain castes that make them want certain things and be opposed to certain things. So they all operate the same way. And monogamy is extremely frowned upon. I think it's even illegal. So the concept is everybody must belong to everybody else. Um, so it's just, yeah, the, the consumerism stuff is pretty on point. And I think that it's a thing that's even hard to turn off just for everybody in general is like to, to stop consuming shit, but to replace that consumption um, with like, you know, it took me ages to stop buying statues all the time. I was like, I just have to stop doing this. It mm -hmm. it, I keep feeling like it fulfills me and I have to stop doing it because it does fulfill me. And that's the problematic part. It's like, <laughs> but it's nice art. Um, but I have to stop doing it, but it's so snowy. It's so pretty. Um, yeah. Replacing the buying a house and having stability and having a car or whatever with like the amount of media that you consume the amount of subscriptions that you have, the amount of films that you the go see. The sense of ownership over that. And you see yeah. that as well manifesting in like how angry people get like at true. changes to media they like or more inclusive media or whatever. That's like, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, hmm. I know they, uh, I think I might have even said this on the show before, but um, I was also reading a very similarly easily discredited thing that I've not thought that hard about. But the idea that people, or I was reading this or somebody told it to me, I keep having it, I don't, I don't even know, that people um, are less likely to be nostalgic for things that happened and more likely to be nostalgic for products now. So when we talk about nostalgia, it's media. We talk about the movies we watched. I think about Pokemon. I think about even Harry Potter. Uh, that's the thing that I grew up reading. Then my nostalgia is tied to brands a lot more often than it's tied to activities. Which is also like a friend or a first kiss or a kind of the standard. What, kind like of when you're like, oh, I'm so nostalgic like, for this, my head goes Nintendo 64. Mm, like straight away, right. Nintendo 64 is the first thing that comes in my head. And and sure, it's the Nintendo 64 because I was playing Mario Party with a group of friends or whatever, but it's still Nintendo 64. But it's the product and the recognizable face that yep. you remember. Again, the way we talk about 80s movies, right? It's like people are nostalgic for 80s movies. You see the poster, you hear the music, you get nostalgic for media mm. rather than experiences. It is nice. One one reassuring thing, and I can't remember which YouTuber did this in a video recently. I can't remember who I was watching, but basically someone pointed out this whole thing that often does the rounds where you'll see like people recognize 
um, <laughs> cartoon character not associated with a current partner of mine <laughs> more than they recognize Jesus, right? Mm. You'll see that kind of do the rounds as like, and people will say, oh, this is, you know, corporations are taking over and, uh, you know, capitalism is the new, is the new religion, all this stuff. And someone I was watching made the point that, um, a similar thing happened in the twenties. Like there was in the twenties, there was a similar survey and it was like, I think it was like a, a, a cartoon character of a cereal box that's completely lost to history. But like at the time was just like the most iconic brand and exactly the same stats of like, more kid, more kids know this cereal brand icon than they know, you know, Father Christmas or Jesus or whatever. Mm. And so it doesn't. I think one of the reasons, one of the, one of the reasons that sci-fi feels prophetic is because it does come to pass. Like sometimes, like the things you see in that in something like Brave New World kind of come th- to fruition. But I think also it's pr- it feels prophetic because people are people and like you're in a world now that's inspiring those same uh connotations and fears and existential crises as was brave new world like the 70s um yeah, I, think so. I mean it came 80, out something like that pretty close to 1984 Let me check mm. i mean th- they were written but they, because but, these men had opinions people. publication date yeah. my guy 1932 no way yeah, it's an old ass book that's wild because even though I'd not read it, I I knew of what was in it and stuff like that. Sounds really that's way ahead of its time. Okay, yeah, I'll just but my point Huxley, is, people- I was just saying this on a podcast to somebody else. Sorry, I'll let you finish your story first. It's an aside. Go ahead. I was just going to say, people are people. Like yeah. like he was reacting to exactly the same world on a human level as we are. Like things feel it's in human nature to feel like things are always getting worse. No, they're but not. That's mainly because of nostalgia. They're not that's at mainly all. because of how you felt. Yeah, I um yeah. I asked my dad recently, I was like, what was it like to actually grow up in the eighties? Like what was that like? And he was like, Oh, it's really free. Mm-hmm. We weren't worried about anything. We weren't worried about crime. And I was like, you know, crime rates have gone down since then. And he was like, that can't be true. Mm-hmm. And so I read him stats because that's the <laughs> asshole that I am. It's like yeah. someone's like, I'll just be like, let me get the statistics. It must be insufferable mm-hmm. to most people who love me. But um, <laughs> and he was like, I can't believe that. And I was like, yeah, you just know about more of it now. We crime rates yeah. are extremely low right now. Um, it's And it's a really fun one to tell boomer parents, especially if they're like, oh, everything, the world's gone to shit. It hasn't. Your Your perception of it has changed. But we have and in defense crime. of boomer parents, they're being piped that message oh, totally. it's not regularly even their fault, by really. all the media that's targeted. Yeah, them and now. like yeah. unless you go in and tell them, actually, crime rates, I think it's virtually globally, have decreased since the 90s. And there's also no statistical mm. reason why. Um, there isn't any actually verified, like because I was looking into it when I had this conversation, there's no actually like completely verified um, indication of why the decline seemed to happen pretty much globally at the same time. And my guess was that it's surveillance. Is it the uh, the? I've risk? heard one theory that's interesting. Go ahead. Birth control. Oh. Birth control plus twenty years. Interesting. Because if you have less unwanted children, you have less criminals. That's I don't know if that's true, but that's the theory in I've heard. Theory: less people in poverty, but I I don't know that poverty rates have decreased at the same rate. I as think the, the yeah I've heard I've heard the theory that. Um, Interesting. Yeah, the, basically, the less unwanted children, the less criminals. I mean, that because it makes it, sense. On a people. lot of yeah. I feel. I feel like surveillance. Also, surely, like you, you can pull out a camera. Now. Science is also possible. Yeah. Well, you say that, but like, I think there's a lot of data because the UK is one of the most like surveilled countries in the world. Like in terms of like, it's scary to Amer- like when Americans come over here, they freak out how many CCTV cameras there are. Mm. But I think there's there's compelling data that that doesn't really have a massive effect on crime rates. Really, over I would have thought least, that the that more surveilled areas don't get hit more. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, Australia's got a lot of CCTV as well. I had a guy mm. uh, I had to report to the cops once do something illegal in. Brisbane and in order to find him they followed my route so they found me coming off the train and then because I was like well I walked here and he was here when he did this and so Mm -hmm. they followed me through the city until they found where I would have gotten there and they were like well I was like he came from the other direction so then they used the cameras like minutes before to find him and that's how they found him and charged him which is nuts it was like you just followed where I was figured out exactly what time I got there and then followed him in the other direction from there it was crazy it was like CCT not so bad not so bad (laughs) yeah it was a dude who uh I was um maybe 14 maybe I was older than that Mm. and he came up to me and offered me um money to buy the underwear that I was wearing 
And so I immediately just, I knew there was a police station around the corner. So I was like, I'm going to tell the cops about this one. That's, I was underage and that was very uncomfortable. And uh, let's just report that one straight away. And it turned out that he had done it to like maybe 10 people uh, that had, had reported it and they were all underage. So That's both talk. incredibly impressive that at 14 you did that, but also completely unsurprising given a lot of the adult that I know that you would absolutely be someone who went, no, no, and solved it. Like, the the one thing that I think about probably, that experience, you probably helped some kids, you probably helped some other girls. My intention was to stop him from doing anything. it again. But the thing that I think about exactly, that interaction, because yeah. obviously I was very uncomfortable, is that I said, no, mm. sorry. Why did I yeah. apologize? And I've gotten that, that has never left my head that I said, no, I'm sorry. Um, and then I think I even said, have a good day. Why did I say sorry? It says a lot, doesn't it, about what the expectations were on you and, and how you and were expected being to talk to men. Yeah, it's like, well, I don't yeah. want to increase the threat or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But I, yeah, that's stuck in my head for sure. But that said, uh, I could I could go on a tangent about the worst thing I saw as a child that I also reported to the police, but uh, that my parents reported that one. But we'll save that for another day. It's, uh, it's been a it this has like been something, a podcast. Something to look forward to. <laughs> um, <laughs> Austin and Troy are in Venice together, which is why they aren't here. The time zone's a bit weird. And They're probably on Austin gondola. said, sorry, our night is running long. And he just sent me this like cool. beautiful picture of, I don't know what this is, but I don't know, some That's Italian Venice. shit. That's Venice. It looks picture of Venice. beautiful. Um, I can pick up where I left off for the audience. We'll, we'll do the whole thing. Um, yeah. Um, hey, look. They loved this last time. It was great. Yeah, you want to keep reading? Someone I was like, can rights. we make this a Patreon thing? And I was like... <laughs> <laughs> I need to call someone at yeah. Disney and work out if I could get the rights was to very uh, good. Do, a, do a full thing. Uh, well, I'm Alana <laughs> Pierce. I'm a video game writer. That is Mike Bithel. He is a video game director. This is Play, Watch, Listen, and we will hopefully see you next week. It's Game Awards, so it's going to be pretty chaotic, but uh, we'll try. Bye, everyone.